Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. We are so happy here on a given Friday. Yes. This is Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel, and we're calling this Community Matters. And that's Steve Petronic. He's the editor of Hawaii Business Magazine. We are thrilled and honored to have him here with us at this table. I'm thrilled and honored to be here. Thank you for <laughs> Great, Steve. You know, you, you know, you have really done something remarkable with Hawaii Business. You know, first it was just a magazine, mm -hmm. and now on top, a really good magazine, and, and very relevant uh, stories about our community, um, uh, telling you things you didn't know. We appreciate that. Okay. Um, and then you got into events for right. the business community, and that was that was great. You're still doing them. Yeah. I'm sure we should talk about them. But most recently, you are the the primo aggregator in this in this state. Right. And I read your stuff every day, Steve. Every Hallelujah. day. Hallelujah. Thank you, it's Jay. It's really really good. It educates me. It takes me beyond where any one single media yep. might. You know, and Hawaii Business has become the king of news for me, honestly. Well, see, the whole idea was we were not into breaking news. We're not into breaking news. So, but we thought uh, all these organizations, they send out a newsletter, but it's all about their own stories. So what we do every morning, we go to about 12 sites in the state, news sites. We find the best stories there. We write a summary, a headline. We link back to the story in case you want to read the whole thing. Sure. And we send that out by uh, email. Every uh, every morning at about eight fifteen, so you get the the top news stories in four or five minutes. You can read the whole thing in yeah. four minutes. Yeah. So I mean, anybody could do that. Yeah. You just have to do it very well. Thank you. You know, there's there's real magic in writing a good headline. There's mm -hmm. real magic in writing a good lead in. Yes. And you can do that because you know the you know the the uh, the, the landscape. You know the context yeah. of it. So you can advance public knowledge mm -hmm. by writing it up, even in what fifty or hundred words, oh. to make it to make it reach me. Yeah, not even that. It's probably it's two sentences, so it's not even thirty words per yeah. summary. But thank you. Uh, we have great people doing that. Uh, Nancy Cook Lauer on the Big Island, she's writing the summaries for it. Jeff Howe here in Honolulu is doing the headlines and checking the links and everything. It it, it we we have gotten amazingly good feedback. Let me tell you the numbers. We started with our initial Initial list of 14,000 people. It's already doubled in less than a year. I sh there should be 60,000, 70,000 people reading it every day because that's the kind of people who want that kind of information. Yeah. We get all kinds of business leaders, nonprofit leaders, government people tell them, they tell me this is a great service. Thank you for doing it. It makes my life so much yeah, easier. Yeah, it does. It's it's your morning your morning news is Some, what it is. Some it's like the New York Times says something like that. Yeah, they did what we're reading, you know, yeah. and they uh, often esoteric stuff we go to the big site. We go to the Star Advertiser, Civil Beat, Hawaii News Now, all the neighbor island papers, yeah, so. and a few of them, you know, Hawaii Public Radio, and we give give you the best of all of them. Yeah, but you know, you do something else too. Yeah, you order them. Yes. <clears throat> you know, because sometimes if I go to one, you know, of the what do you call it, more primary news source, the yeah. sources that you refer to, I, I I may wonder why they ordered it in a certain yeah. way. Mm -hmm. When I go when I go to Hawaii Business and the aggregation aggregation list, I don't wonder because I understand that you have actually put your brain cells on ordering them in a priority that's meaningful. Well, this is you. really important to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's called news judgment. <laughs> it must be. And, and yeah, uh, it's an acquired skill. Um, we think about what, when news judgment is basically a story that's going to have the most impact on the most people. That's your, it's almost like a utilitarian philosophy. Yeah. Most impact on the most people. And, and so, uh, but we also do it by island. So we've got the big statewide stories leading the newsletter, and then there's Oahu stories and Maui stories, Big Island, and Kauai stories. So if you're only interested in one of those, just zoom straight to Maui and, and you get all your local news. Something for everyone. Yeah. So, and it, <coughs> and it was also a good way for us to get our stories out because there's a huge audience of people that don't read Hawaii Business Magazine, but we have great stuff. We have stories on sexual harassment, on immigration, on affordable housing, on the airports. Very all kinds, timely. Yeah. And we want to reach people with those stories too. So. Yeah, uh, you know, mixed in with those breaking news stories are our stories. It's a win, 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 win. I mean, I know why I win as yeah. a reader. Yeah. But I think uh, you know the 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 news organizations that you're linking to, mm -hmm. they win. 
They get readership by virtue so. of your efforts. Because there are people that won't be going to them otherwise. People don't have the time to go to all these websites every day. Right. Yeah. We, we, you, we tell you them. Help, you help the guy who wants it quick. Yeah. And this is very valuable. And wants all of it. You know, all the news that's fit to, to read really is what it is. Right. Because you capture so much. The other thing is, it's got to be helping the magazine. It's got to be helping your other activities, like the, the meal events and the training events. Right. So uh, we make a little money off of it because we sell some advertising, top, bottom, middle. Mm -hmm. uh, we're telling people about our events so we can advertise the Wahine Forum or our leadership uh, conference or the next Small Business Academy. All those things are advertised in, so reaching all kinds of people. And we're a monthly magazine, and yes, we have new content on our website every day this comes out every every weekday yeah. so it's reaching people every day which so is instead something of one impression a month you have 30 impressions exactly one impression well uh, weekdays only so okay. so 22 it's maybe. 20 whatever yeah okay <laughs> so yeah and i think that's important and part of our job is not just to make money it's to generate conversation in the community tell people about the big issues it's a public service yes it is so it i, I think it does all Steve. yeah all right. My idea. All right. My uh, hero, Steve uh, Petronic. I, I must give credit to Nancy, though. Nancy Cook Lauer, she's the reporter that we can thank for learning the truth about Billy Kanoy. She, <laughs> she stayed on that story and pounded, tried to get those records for a long, long time until finally she got a hold of them. We found out we spelled That's a great segue to something I would like to talk to you about, and that is the, you know, the role of the press these days. We have the war on the press. We have all this fake news yeah. confusion going on. We have the decline of the democratic ideals that we have grown up with yeah. in terms of the, you know, the press and its role and its, its power, its influence. And now it's, it's being attacked yeah. and being questioned at every turn. And so and there are things happening. There are things happening where the only one who's doing anything about a given problem in our society is the press. Well. And, and nothing will happen unless the press, until the press speaks. This is really important. And I see you as, as fully understanding that and advancing that notion. Press, uh, for any change to happen, people need to know about the problems that exist and the possible solutions that exist. So a free press uh, uh, and a vigorous media is a necessary condition for change, for improvement, for even st for, for democracy to, to flourish and, and even survive. Most important book in America today, the book you need to read is Why Democracies Fail. It's written by two Harvard professors. Uh, one has a expertise in Latin America. The other, I think, is in, in modern European history. Why do, they've seen democracies fail. We've studied it. Mussolini, Hitler, Perón in Argentina, um, the fellow in Venezuela, his name escapes me right now. The, uh, the, there's a, almost like a pattern to how these uh, democracies failed, and some of those same things that happened in those countries are happening in America today. The, the attacks on the news media, the attacks on the independence of the judiciary, uh, of the Justice Department, and so on, and, and, and those things are happening. The, the demagoguery where um, even a powerful political party with a great tradition is starting to see some of, is willing to give up some of the safeguards of democracy in order to maintain power and to, to s spread its power. And uh, there, there is a lot of um, those dictators in what we see in what Trump is doing. Yes. You know, Mussolini didn't get to be a dictator overnight. It was a path. And the same and, thing with Adolf Hitler. Exactly. It was a path. And what was interesting is that both Mussolini and Hitler used established politicians who, uh, to get to power. And those established politicians thought they could use Mussolini. They thought they could use Hitler to help themselves. And instead, those guys took over. And that's happened with the Republican Party. They thought they could use Trump. But he has taken over. Now, they are all beholden to Trump. And he yeah. has the, the voters' ear. And, and as a result, now they have to kowtow to him instead of use him. Same thing. And it happened in they all They thought of them. they could use him. In fact, he's using them. Right, right. And he's on that path. I got a book for you, too, called Democracy in Chains by mm -hmm. Nancy McLean. Mm -hmm. And uh, she is a reporter. She went to, you know, did investigative reporting on how some of these uh, Republican races were funded mm -hmm. uh, to move the needle over to the extremist 
right. And, uh, and it's, it's, it didn't happen by accident. It happened with, with big money, and it happened with a, a concerted effort to move the needle to the right, and that has happened. And those guys are really wrecking, in my opinion, wrecking our country. Mm -hmm. And it's part of that same phenomenon that you talk about, right. uh, the decline of democracy in general. Right. It, a willingness to shade the, the rules a bit, whether it's the written rules, the constitutional rules, or whether it's the established morals and ethics that we have, you know, of bipartisanship, of, of, uh, of things like that. For, and, and the, um, the authors of the book I mentioned, Why Democracies Failed, cite four different, very egregious things that have been done, all unfortunately done by the Republican Party. One was the not uh, accepting, a, uh, not even considering a Supreme Court nomination from the president. Uh, what happened in North Carolina, where it was ba basically a coup d'etat when the governor, elected governor was a Democrat. They, the Republican legislature basically rewrote the rules to take away any power from the oh, governor. And, and that coming on the heels, of course, that infamous uh, uh, voting rights uh, bill that was passed, which basically was um, explicitly created to prevent black people from voting by restricting the number of advanced voting days uh, and, and so on. Um, and of course, that on top of gerrymandering to the nth degree, which has already existed in America, but gotten so, much, much worse. So free for all, and so many people in this country either A, are willingly violating you know, the, the founder's intention mm -hmm. over the Constitution, state and federal, uh, and B, they don't know. They never got trained in it. Mm -hmm. They didn't study it in school. And so, you know, the press is an education. Right. And sometimes it's the only education people get in their adult lives. Right. And so, you know, you have a huge burden. But I think you're meeting that burden, really. You're an important, important factor in the press for this state. No mm -hmm. kidding, Steve. Well, I think a lot of it has to do with um, uh, ownership. I've worked for a lot of different companies. Some of them were very bottom line driven, like the uh, Gannett chain, which owned the Honolulu Advertiser for many years, and before that, the Star Bulletin. Uh, it, it uh, you know, our, our ownership is Dwayne Carrizo, who's a local boy, grew up on a plantation. It's all about giving back to the community that, that helped you, um, uh, and so the magazine is about that philosophy of giving back. We're all in this together. Uh, how do we make it work? Whether it's affordable housing, whether it's creating jobs, Good jobs for people. It's about uh, supporting nonprofits and and making government work efficiently and effectively. All those issues are things we cover in the magazine every month, and we're um, find it a privilege to be able to report on that yeah, sort of stuff. Yeah, we can take a short break, Steve, and when we come back, we're going to talk to Steve Petranik some more about what the important stories are and what they will be going forward. Um, and you know the role of the reporter in writing them up and selecting the material, writing it up, and in having, uh, maybe this is too strong a word, but a takeaway, a takeaway that he would like the public to think about and that he, he would like to make change. And how do you do that? How appropriate is it to try to do that uh, in, 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 in the press, mm -hmm. within the, the rules of the, uh, the ethical rules of the society, professional journalists, of which you are a strong member, I know yes. that. Yeah, we'll be right back. Thank you. Hey, hey baby, that's you. I want to know, will you watch my show? I hope you do. It's on Tuesdays at 1 o'clock, and it's out of the comfort zone, and I'll be your host, R.B. Kelly. See you there. Aloha, I'm Richard Concepcion, the host of Hispanic Hawaii. You can watch my show every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. We will bring you entertainment, educational, and also we tell you what is happening right here within our community. Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Welcome to Sister Power. I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, where we motivate, educate, empower, and inspire all women. We are live here every other Thursday at 4 p.m., and we welcome you to join us here at Sister Power. Aloha and thank you. We're back. We're live. We're back with an old friend, Steve Petranik, who is the editor of Hawaii Business Magazine, who is doing great work in informing the public about important things. 
And we've been talking about the role of the press and how important it is, maybe more important now than it has been before in our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. And it has to be protected, it has to be cherished, actually. So um, one of the things is that if you look at media, especially outside the mainstream original news sources like the New York Times, the Washington Post, and so forth, mm -hmm. um, sometimes they select raw meat stories. Right. And I, mean, I have an aversion to raw meat stories <laughs> 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 because I know that it's, it doesn't mean anything. It's not. It's, it's to titillate me maybe or entertain me, uh -huh. but it is. Uh, uh, you know, and it's a thread maybe that the the news gatherers think I need to know about, but I don't. Um, so, you know, and you don't have that. You have no. real solid stories in your aggregation and for that matter in the magazine. Well, well one, of, one of the principles we go by is we cover stories that we don't see anybody else covering or we go after an angle that nobody's covering. So, um, you know, we, or, or what we do is we take a national story, for instance, our cover story in the February issue, sexual harassment. And we took a, obviously a big national story, and we we localized it. We you know how where is it happening now, and what can companies and organizations do to prevent it, or first off under uncover it if it's happening, and then prevent it from happening in the future. Because, and and uh, very powerful cover. You know we even went to the extent of not only we have a powerful cover with a man's hand reaching over a woman's shoulder. We made sure his wedding ring is on. <laughs> That's good. And, and uh, our designer, Janelle Kalave Ching, uh, did a, a different stock that, of paper for the cover, which has a grittier feel. So you feel something's not right Tactile. here. Tactile. Tactile. <laughs> so brilliant on that. But that sort of story, uh, we're, we're looking at immigration, another national story. Well, what does it mean for Hawaii? And, and of course, uh, and a very positive angle on that, but we also have a second story, and I can't tell you about that because we are breaking news with that. Nobody else has done this story, but it's a negative angle on on immigration. So we've got the positive, the negative, and because immigration is very complicated, it's not one issue. It's like a thousand issues mixed into one. There, <sighs> there's economics, there's there's resentment, there's competition, there's catalyst, yes. the startup economy. All those yes. things are mixed up in it yes. and, and and that's all it has under to the, be nuanced. We have yeah. to we can't just have it positive, negative, red, white, yeah. blue, green. No, you have to look at all the sides of it. Really educate the public about right. this. And I think a lot of a lot of times, uh, you know, the press will take a position always the same, always beating up on this issue or mm -hmm. enhancing that issue. You're absolutely right. I, I think there's there's always new, not always, but many times yeah. there's nuance, and the public should know, you know, the fine points as well. Right, right. So you know, we we did a story about the airports, and and when this is a few months back, but how that under government management, the airports are just falling into decay because you can't react quick enough to create a project. It takes years and years to build anything. What about an independent airport authority? I think that was a really good story. Um, Where'd you come out on that? Well, that it seemed to be the logical thing to do. It, it, it's, you know, if something isn't, it's like Roosevelt did in, in the depression. If something's not working, try something else, you know? Uh, it may not always work, but you you can't keep doing the same things and making repeating the same mistakes over and over and over again. <laughs> what is it, this definition of insanity? It, it's you definition. keep on doing the same thing with the expectation somehow it's going to change right, the result. Right, right. So, so change things up. And it, it's a model that's worked elsewhere. So it's not like it's we're creating from whole cloth. No. It, it's been very successful in other places, so give it a shot. Government, government must take risks once in a while. Right. You know, they, they, all the officials cannot just protect their own Ocoles. They gotta take risks. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they have to be prodded to take risks. Right, now. well, and that's part of the job of the media. But to go to the airport authority question for a minute, mm -hmm. you know, it seems to me that uh, one of the roles of the press, especially, really especially, distinguished from other places in Hawaii, is that we have this kind of consensus model Nobody wants to take risks. Nobody wants to actually solve the problem. Everyone wants to kick the can down the road right. forever and ever. You know, and it's the press, to me, and I think you agree, it, the press's obligation to point that out. Right. We've got to come to an end of it. We can't just have those spinning around over and over again with no result. Yeah. Put the study on the shelf, let it gather dust, have another study, right. and the result is no action, and the public suffers. No, no, absolutely. And, and, and when it's something works, um, we have to describe how it worked and why and, and, and suggest as an alternative. For instance, we do a story on, uh, on homelessness, and, and like I said, we don't cover what has already been covered. So what we did is we looked at three 
solutions that people have come up with. One was Dwayne Carizu's Kahogiki Village over at Sad Island. So he's it's this an important project. Important for sure. project, and it's uh, the first people moved in uh, a few weeks ago. So we took a look at that and how that collaboration happened, how it can be replicated. Uh, stuff that Stanford Carr is doing for affordable housing in Kaka'ako and elsewhere in Hawaii. Um, and and um, uh, Savio, Peter Savio's efforts, he had a completely different model. His was more market-based type thing, but an idea of how to put more people into affordable homes and, and different approaches. So things that were working seem to be working, telling those stories, that's important for us. You know, in, in my observation, and I'm not the perfect guy to deal with this, but in my observation, more and more the stories I see and like are the stories that actually take a position on things, mm -hmm. including the New York Times, which I read, one of the reasons I read is because they do take a position on things. Right. You get a clear feeling on what they want you to take away from that story. Yeah. Even if it's um, you know strictly journalism, and I wonder if uh, the SPJ, Society of Professional Journalists, ethic on this is changing, or maybe not so much, you know, uh, not so much center, center stream these days. Yeah. Because I think the, the press has an obligation, to me now, yeah. to actually express a view. Now you can say, well, just the facts, man, just the facts. We're only going to report exactly what happened. But I think, you know, you missed the opportunity to give me some value, yeah. and I missed knowing what you really think. Yeah. And it's not just an op-ed thing or an editorial. Yeah. I want to see in the, in the interstices of what you write how you feel. Is that wrong? So there's a lot of people that feel the way you feel. Um, uh, I, uh, one of the greatest compliments I ever had was uh, someone who worked with me for many years, 15 years, at the advertiser in the Star Bulletin, and she told me, you know, I've worked with you all this time. I have no idea what your politics are. <laughs> now, you've heard what I've just been saying earlier, but in my decisions in the newsroom, how I handled stories, and, and she was working, you know, 20 feet away from me and, and knew what a lot of those decisions were. She didn't know my politics, and I think I was very proud of that. Now, uh, anybody who spends any time with me at a bar knows what my <laughs> feelings are, but I try not to let them cloud how, how I uh, tackle issues. And I want to see a lot of different voices in, in, in the media because one of the issues is that you, we don't have all the answers. And we've got to uh, throw the net broadly. We have to have a broad net rather than a single line when we write stories. One of the reasons Trump was elected is because a lot of the East Coast media wasn't in tune with what Middle America was thinking about. They didn't about. see it coming. They didn't see it coming and because they weren't doing those stories or when they did it, they weren't uh, listening to the possible response. They were part. They were. They were there, but they weren't hearing everything. And um, that's natural because their audience was East Coast based. So what you've got to do is try and be as many things as you can, while being intelligent, while being uh, resourceful about what you're and covering things other people aren't covering. I mean, there's a thousand people covering. Uh, you know, celebrity news and, and restaurants and so on. We stay away from those things. We're covering stuff that other people aren't. Yeah, We're I feel the same way. This is the most, that's the greatest contribution you can make to fill in the gaps, yeah. that's to what find what the gaps are. Mm -hmm. You know, what is our society, what is our public conversation missing? Right. Let, and, and, I mean, sea changes that are really happening, right. not just made up, but sea changes that people ought to be thinking about and revealing that to them is well, very and, valuable. Being as useful, it's, we're a business magazine, so one of the things we're is trying things that are useful for businesses. How do you innovate? How do you recruit here in this economy? It, it started coming up in the, in the next couple of months <coughs> about, you know, we have a 2% unemployment late rate in Hawaii. It's even less on Oahu. And um, one of the reasons these jobs go begging is because you're not paying enough for people to survive here. So you've got people with innovative solutions. Well, maybe they're, they're uh, providing housing, or maybe they're helping their, their uh, employees to get the license or the certification or the training they need so they can get the higher level job. They can provide more value to the company, and therefore the company can pay them more. So the, you know, instead of just thinking inside the box because that's not working, people can't afford to live here anymore. Yeah, you can't be a fast food and live even if you had three fast food jobs that wouldn't do it no so it wouldn't do it yeah. and it's not and and you're actually doing better for the community by getting the right person with the right skills in the right job so you ever go on missions you know uh, like where you say look 
we want, I, I, and I don't know if this is a mission of yours, we want higher wages in this community. So yeah. we're going to write a story now and a story later. We're going to pepper you know, our network yeah. with stories about higher wages. For example, yeah. uh, it, it becomes um, a kind of crusade, if you yeah. will, um, by one media about one issue. I know some media do that. Do you yeah. do that? We do affordable housing is one that we've got over after, uh, time and time again, whether it's like, how do you finance an affordable housing? What grants and state and uh, federal funding is there? Uh, tax breaks for your investors and so on. We've done that story. We've done the permitting thing. We've gone after it many times in what is the process? How can we make the process better? Whether we've looked at it, how it's done somewhere else on the mainland, or what are the flaws in the current system we have at the county level? We've done, you know, the, the story I mentioned earlier about the different models of different people's models for creating affordable housing. That, that's one we've tackled over and over again. And sometimes we've repeated ourselves over the years, but it's such an important topic. It is, it is the most it important is. issue here because it, it feeds into so well, much of you know th our think, lives. think of what happens if we ignore it. Think right. of the think of the dark side. Right. Uh, it's really awful in terms of speculating the result. So I, you know, I, I wonder if um, you know this is very valuable, and and to me, I think the great value is in the people who are the policymakers. You know, they should know about all the options that you're considering, all the mm -hmm. possibilities you're ruminating about and re revealing. Um, are they reading you? Uh, you get feedback from them. Do you get feedback either online or otherwise from the people who you would like to affect? I, I a lot more business leaders than um, than politicians. I'm not sure. We, we distribute to all the politicians. We make sure they get copies, especially, and we really push special issues that we do when we do our quality of life report. Um, but I know I'm, I'm reaching the business community. I'm you know, And a lot of, that's very valuable because we have a very engaged business community here. The leaders of the locally owned organizations are very involved with the nonprofit community and with um, you know, the community itself. So I think we're very privileged to have that here. I think one of the challenges is the mainland owned companies, you know, the Safeways, the Costco's, those, those companies aren't as engaged with the local community. Yes, they give occasionally and they, they make, uh, they trumpet that, but they're, they don't have their leaders on the nonprofit right. board. And they're not looking at local issues. No, really. the, the decisions are made somewhere else. Yeah. So that's a huge impediment to change in Hawaii. Yeah. The, the, Best news, though, is that the, the local business leaders are really engaged. The vast majority of them are engaged, and they care about the community. Because, you got to get them to run for office, Steve. Well, you know, the last one that did that was Walter Dodds. I asked that at a session where Walter was speaking after he wrote his book. I got up in line, and I asked a question just like anybody else, and said, Walter, why aren't business, you, you were a business leader. You were involved in politics uh, very much, and, and to a degree, partisan politics. And he gave a, a thoughtful answer. He said, yes, but a lot of them are afraid of being identified with one party or another. And they're afraid they'll lose customers for that reason. And he said he never let his partisan, he was a Democratic, he was a very um, influential person in the Democratic Party in Hawaii. Uh, but he never let that influence his business decisions. And so he was able to do business with Republicans and Democrats alike. Um, I, I, whether they are Republicans or Democrats, I think, yes, business leaders uh, would be very valuable. But they know to how to get to things see. done, by they, definition. Absolutely. You know, I, I would, you know we, we haven't covered, and I'm sorry we don't have enough time, but we haven't covered a lot of the stories you have covered. And sometime, maybe in a series of mm -hmm. times, I, I'd like to sit with you like this and teach, you know, discuss each one of those stories and, and, and what you've done, uh, your your reporting on it, uh, your conclusions on it, your suggestions on it. Mm -hmm. I hope you'll be available for to just to do that again. Absolutely. So, Steve, uh, you're going to stay with this, right? You're going to retain, you know, you know, your editor status. You're going to. You, you're not going to run for office, are you, Steve? No, no. I don't be clear about that. <laughs> I thought about that. Uh, maybe after I retire, but no, I don't know. You, you, you have to take too many stands that are unpopular if you're in the news business for any long time. Make too many enemies. I don't think that would be a, a wise uh, choice for. Me. I wouldn't complain if you did. <laughs> Steve Petranic, editor of Hawaii Business Magazine. Thanks, Thank Jay. you so much. Always a pleasure.